Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Advisory Committee's public hearing on uh, the 2013 Annual Town Meeting Warrant. Uh, I'd like to, uh, my name is Mark Brandon, I'm the chair of the committee, and I'd like to inter introduce the rest of our committee here. Uh, from, my, from my left, uh, we have George Pucci, Eric Siri, Landy Rude, <coughs> Ben Williams, our vice chair, Mary Wolf, Jeff Rudin, Vicki Rellis, and Russ Pollock. Um, I just want to spend a few minutes going over the format of the meeting so we all know what the ground rules are. We're going to take the warrant uh, in order of uh, appearance uh, with two possible exceptions that I'm going to talk about later. Um, we'll ask each proponent to make a presentation if they'd like to, um, and we would ask them to limit themselves to five minutes. Uh, we will have a, uh, Eric Siri will be timing us and we'll give you a heads up when you're getting close to the end. Um, we will then invite any public comment uh, on the article and in that case we would ask you to limit yourself to two minutes and um, to keep in mind that um, it's most beneficial if when speaking you can bring something new to the conversation rather than necessarily just trying to reinforce what we've already heard. Uh, it's going to be a long day. Um, I am I'm planning a hard stop at 5 o'clock uh, today um, with some optimism that we can be done before that, but we'll see. Um, at that point, we're going to, uh, to bring the discussion up here to uh, the table. Um, and then once we're done discussing it, we'll call for any additional public comment based on what you've heard and then open the voting session. Um, you should know that uh, any of the um, uh, committee members can request that a vote be postponed until our meeting on Tuesday evening, right. to either to get new, uh, new information or just if they need to uh, spend a little more time thinking about what they've heard. Um, so before I get started, are there any questions up here? Good. Let's get started then. Article 1. I'll take a motion to accept uh, Article 1 to hear and act on the reports of the various town officers and committees as contained in the annual town report or otherwise. Moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Article 2. To, uh, to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate or transfer from available funds a sum of money, and if so, what sum for unpaid bills or take any other action related thereto. Uh, and we have five uh, unpaid bills left over, uh, $528 to Ruane and Father for Woodhaven Elder Housing, $35.28 to Unifirst for CM&D Clothing, <coughs> $29.54 to NSTAR Electric for the transfer station, $62.56 to Verizon for Council on Aging, and $250 to Information Networks for the Board of Selectmen. So I'll take a motion to approve Article 2. Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Ah, certainly. <coughs> Were there any dissensions on either of the first two? No. No, okay. <coughs> All right, Article 3. Let me, uh, let me start off by saying that um, we are not going to, uh, to vote Article 3 today. Um, the, uh, the town accountant is not in attendance. And I think it's prudent that before we take a final vote on, uh, on the budget that we review the, these numbers with, with her, make sure they all add up. Uh, but however, we will be discussing them. And um, for those of you who have been following, uh, you may know that uh, we begin a, uh, an accounting model um, at the beginning of the process. Um, and uh, we are now on version 10. 
and uh, basically we, we track all of the changes to the budgets as, uh, um, as they come through along with any changes to estimates and revenues. Um, we then, um, so, so the, the version 10, which was, uh, which was issued uh, last by the town accountant before she left, um, left us with a, uh, a gap of 100, about $134,000, which would uh, need to be raised either through an override or the use of free cash. Uh, since then, you'll also find Model 10A, which has been uh, modified by David Williams, a new town administrator, which reflects uh, some other changes to, uh, to three of the line items, which leaves us with a, uh, a deficit of $79,000. And um, that is the one that I'm going to... Um, that I'm going to move the numbers from. And the way we're going to do that is I will read each line item. And if there's one that somebody would like to discuss, uh, I ask that you call out hold. And then we will go back and revisit all of the held, uh, the held lines. Is there any questions on, on that procedure? So, I don't remember seeing it. Line 122, Selectman Payroll, $101,156. Line 122, Selectman Expenses, 28863 Town Administrator Payroll, $129,000. Town Line 151, Town Council, $65,000. Hold. I'm sorry. Town Council. Uh, line 141, Assessor's Payroll, $101,176. Assessor's Expenses, $13,275. I missed the transfer station, my apologies. Line 430, Transfer Station, $259,586. Line 145, Treasurer Payroll, $99,254. Treasurer Expenses, $22,803. Tax Collector Payroll, line 146, $94,715. Tax Collector Expenses, $19,552. Line 135, Town Account and Payroll, $94,606. Town account and expenses, $19,016. Town account and annual audit, $24,750. Line 131, advisory committee payroll, $455. Advisory committee expenses, $3,495. Line 175, planning board payroll, $40,000. <coughs> Planning board expenses, $1,540. Planning board is $40,002. and two. Thank you, Carol. Line 161, town clerk payroll, $85,332. Town clerk expenses, $5,204. Line 162, election and registration payroll, $29,124. Election and registration expenses, $12,302. It's line 162. Uh, 
line 192, town building expenses, $211,829. Line 210, police department payroll union, $816,200. Police payroll non-union, $98,288. Police payroll overtime, $90,000. Police payroll other contractual, $267,361. Police department expenses, $81,650. Police cruiser, $34,000. Line 220, fire rescue payroll, $355,078. Fire rescue expenses, $94,180. <clears throat> Line 241, builder inspector's payroll, $68,875. Building inspector's expenses, Line 301, Dover Sherburn Regional School, $7,842,898. Oh. Dover Sherburn Regional High School debt, again, this is all line 301, $718,891. Tri-County Vocational Tech, $39,282. Sherburn Schools Payroll and Expense, $4,028,959. Oh. Pine Hill Special Education, $1,745,868. <clears throat> Sherburn Schools uh, out of district, $1,190,943. You hold, please. Norfolk Agricultural, line 316, $90,808. Line 401, CM&D Payroll Union, $396,154. CM&D Payroll Non-Union, $100,795. CM&D Expenses, $377,258. Line 512, Board of Health Payroll, $61,815. Board of Health Expenses, $66,924. Line 610, library payroll, $265,367. Library expenses, $129,022. Line 650, recreation expenses, $9,962. Line 635, farm pond payroll, $90,143. Farm Pond Expenses, $13,441. Line 541, Council on Aging Payroll, $99,111. Council on Aging Expenses, $22,950. Line 171, Conservation Payroll, $45,651. Conservation Expenses, $4,259. Line 543, Veterans Agent Expenses, $2,300. Line 691, Historical Commission, $500. <coughs> Line 433, Recycling, $3,942. Line 491, Cemetery, $45,670. Line 545, Elderly Housing Expenses, 
$157,894. Line 919, Insurance General, $166,088. Line 910, Employee Benefits Insurance, $1,990,962. To hold, please. Line 710, debt retirement, $1,472,000, sorry, $1,472,136. Line 990, reserve fund, $60,000. So ordinarily we would, we would vote all of the unheld line items, uh, but again, we're going to wait until we have a chance to meet with the town accountant uh, before doing that. I have noted as holds uh, line 151, town council. Line, lines in 301 for uh, Dover Sherburn Regional Sherburn Share. Dover Sherburn Regional High School Debt, Sherburn Schools Payrolls and Expense, Pine Hill Special Education, and Sherburn Schools Out of District, and line 910, Insurance Employee Benefits. I miss anybody? Peter. Um, is that what you were voting on? You let all all submitted by this. Yeah, but these are the ones that you will you will recommend them when you vote on. That's right. These are the ones that are add up in the model. Mark, is this well, being recorded? I'm sorry, I thought you were No, I'm I'm not clear. It, it's it's entitled okay. submitted budgets. <laughs> So as the, as the department submitted them, these are going to approve them as submitted. No, these are, the, these are either submitted or amended by the town administrator. Uh, then they're not the submitted budgets as titled. That's a confusion. Well, oh. okay. I think Kitty had a question. Uh, yes, is this being recorded? I just had a text from someone saying they can't pick it up at home. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. It's on. It's on. Pat it's says it's on. That helps. Yeah. Valerie. Mark, on, on the, uh, the Sherborne School um, payroll and expenses and also on this bed. We wanted to check the numbers. Those those two were okay with what we'd like to address the, the following items. Well, we're, going to, we're going to take each of these in order, okay. and you'll have a chance to, okay. to discuss them. But I think we're okay with the first two. It's the third one that there's a discrepancy. That we okay. Um, whoever held on town council? I, I did. My, I, I have no objection to the... Um, to the number. My only concern on it is it seems we always under budget for town council and you know it does that make sense? It and I'll stand corrected if we always come in at that number, but it seems that we always come in above that number and we're looking for reserve fund transfers. So does it does it make sense to budget for town council at only sixty five thousand if we're reasonably sure we'll exceed that? Unless you unless the selectmen think that we're gonna come better in line with that. Well, we did discuss that, and I had expressed in some of our meetings, you know, some concern about that, but a number of the legal cases that we've been involved in have been resolved, number one, resolved in this fiscal year. And so the board decided to stick with this number looking forward. And to the extent that we do have exposure, like this year, we, did, we have yet to come to, uh, for a reserve fund transfer, we don't think we'll have to, and we're going to capture any excess in the supplementals. Great. So I think uh, for the time being, that, that makes prudent sense. That sounds good to me. That's, that was the only, I just had a question. No, that's a good question. That's great. 
Okay. Thank you, Peter. Okay, Dover Regional Sherburn Share. Richard Robinson, Regional School Committee. I, I'm sorry, I may have misunderstood uh, the nature of the process, and so uh, perhaps we don't need to discuss that. Is it your intent to, to recommend and then vote on the numbers in the submitted column? My, my intent is to, is to move mm -hmm. these numbers to, to, a to a vote. To move them to a vote. Okay. Uh, those are the numbers we're comfortable with, and uh, unless the committee has any questions for us, then I think we're fine. Uh, Dover Sherburn Regional High School debt. Did oh, your comments apply to the I'm debt sorry, too? Same thing. Yeah, yeah, same Great. Thing. Uh, Sherburn Schools payroll and expense. Again, apologies for misunderstanding. Um, we are okay. Valerie, with would you just introduce yourself, oh, I'm please? I'm sorry. Valerie Spriggs, Superintendent for Dover Sherburn and Sherborne Public Schools. Um, and I did put the hold on it because we were feverishly trying to make sure that the numbers, especially since um, you were holding off, we wanted to make sure that you had the correct numbers from us. So we are in agreement with the, um, the uh, payroll and expenses and also the SPED. Um, we would like to hold on the out of district. It looks to us as though there's about a $20,000 discrepancy between what our figures are and what's been recorded here. So we'd like to be able to check on that for you. Well, I think it would be appropriate at this point to. Sure, I held that, Valerie. And, and I apologize because uh, uh, very late in the day, working with my, with my favorite town administrator, we were trying to uh, satisfy the needs of the people up at that table with a suggestion of how to uh, resolve the large deficit in the model that uh, as shown, which reflects the original numbers you had. So we provided two, three suggested changes, which is what Mark is now using as uh, model 10A. One of those changes was to a slight increase in the amount of circuit breaker percentage anticipated. And I couldn't get back to you because it was late in the day and my favorite 16 year old had a thing going and here we are, and I apologize. So it, it's a suggestion to, it's still within the 40 to 50% range. I know you're more comfortable with 40%. I was too, but it was, it's a suggestion. It's for these folks to, uh, you know, use in their model. It is a means by which they can get to a point of uh, a number that's comfortable, from what I understand in talking to Mark, uh, for the free cash number that they might have to apply, even though they haven't addressed that number yet. Um, okay, so, so it's still not going to 70%, which some folks were talking about, but it is raising the number that from your original comfort level of 40%, and you can throw things at me all you want. It is a $20,000 difference, and if it doesn't fly, it doesn't fly. It, and, and that's agreeable to advisory? Well, we, have, we haven't voted it. We, uh, okay, you know, let, they, let me, let me share with you. Have. I feel as though we've kind of exhausted this subject with your meeting the other evening, and I don't think that I necessarily need to revisit it. I think Peter no, but I clarified. Think, I mean, I, um, we're here to disseminate information, so I would, I would make your, right. your point. My, uh, we base our projection on the economic situation that we are now confronted with and a lack of additional knowledge as to what we may be able to expect as far as state funding. So we have done level funding. Um, in the past, our circuit breaker has been um, rather um, unpredictable. We've been told to budget low and then they come in high. So, um, and Ben, I thank you for the numbers that you provided us at the other uh, meeting. Um, I continue to be concerned about additional state funding. I think that if advisory knows that if we go with a higher percentage and we are granted a lower percentage and there are needs, um, I, we will have no alternative but to come knocking at the door and to ask the town to honor that part of our agreement. And I think if we all understand that. Yes. Um, I, I, I think we, we do understand that. Um, <coughs> You know, it's, 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 it's a tough balancing act. It's trying a very to pull tough Trying to all this together act. and meet the needs of, of the, you know, of, of our children and to meet the needs of, our, you know, the police department and public safety and, 
you know, we're really at the fine-tuning stage now where, um, you know, one of the goals of advisory at, together with the selectmen here was to, um, was to not use any free cash, frankly. Um, and there are people uh, here who would... I understand that goal. Yeah, I let, me, let me just... Uh, but uh, I think given the, um, you know, the use of reserves by the regional school system, as an example, they've dipped deep into their reserves, um, that it's not necessarily... Uh, the right thing for us to hold fast to that. Uh, we've also had a little bit of an uptick in uh, in free cash, which was some which was some good news, which has freed up some money. But um, clearly, we need to continue to take the town down the path of relying less and less on its reserves to fund ongoing uh, uh, operations. So, you know, twenty thousand dollars doesn't sound like a lot of money in the context of things, but we're really coming to the point where uh, it, it is um, it is important. I think. You know, we can if we if we turn out to be completely wrong, and it does go the other way. I think the town can absorb that. We've raised the reserve fund from last year. Uh, we went from forty-five thousand to sixty thousand, so we have a little more room to maneuver in, in, in that kind of an event. But doing this will allow the town to show a continued reduction in, in its reliance on on its reserves, and I think is a very healthy step forward. I would also share with you that since this was without any knowledge of the Sherborne School Committee and this is not the figure that was approved, that it will have to go back to the school committee, you know, for them to uh, approve it. Not all of our members were able to be with us at the public hearing tonight or today. So um, that also it's, it's, uh, was a bit of a surprise for us. Um, and I would also say that I can respect what you're saying. Certainly the region has had that same conversation regarding their E&D. Um, I also think that you have a, 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 a one-time help with the additional circuit breaker that the town um, has access to to be able to help not only the public schools but the other departments. And I, I do respect what you're saying as far as not having to go uh, deeper into reserves. Um, we, we feel that also. So thank you for the time to be able to address it. And Mark, I think I'm within my five minutes. Uh, we're trying really hard. <laughs> well, we allow extra for people who are uh, contributing to the cause. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that takes us through all the holds. No, no, I, I, I held uh, one more, which just was the, the, uh, the down at the employee uh, benefits. Oh, yes. Thank one you. of the things that was done uh, in the health benefits line item, uh, the town had a $40,000 reserve. And uh, one of the ways to achieve your objectives there on the lower use of free cash was to reduce that reserve for uh, potential new additions to the plan from 40000 to 15000 So there's a $25,000 pickup in that line item. Uh, and while I'm at it, the other thing, in, so that was part of the model of 10A, the switch from 10 to 10A that w has been provided to you and which you're moving forward. The other piece was a, a reduction that David had done in the uh, ten, in, of ten thousand dollars in the overlay in the other the first page of the model that's still subject to assessor approval uh, they are evaluating that and at their next meeting they'll they'll come back to the town with a number but for purposes of what you're doing today and evaluating the exposure on free cash uh, it seemed like uh, something worth doing great thank okay. you okay. Do thank we you hear from them before Tuesday before we can vote? That one, no. Can I ask a question? Yeah. On the, uh, let me turn this on. Um, Peter, in the, the reduction of the reserve on the, uh, <clears throat> for the benefits for, for potential new employees coming yes. into the program. So the, uh, the reduction is nice. That, uh, in one instance, it's an accounting move, and so it works. My question is, how did the original reserve of 40000 relate to experience? And how does the 15000 relate to experience? Historically, the town has um, uh, turned back monies on its projections of benefits, health benefits. This year, uh, there were some new additions to the plan that weren't anticipated, and uh, those are being picked up in the supplementals, as you see. And so even in this situation, if, if the reserve is not sufficient for new additions next year that aren't anticipated, because there's always changes in who's in and who's out, um, and that also depends on some turnover of employees and so forth. Um, it would be picked up in supplemental, but, but rather than include that 25,000 in the base, um, the permanent base, if you will, 
um, here. That's that. So it's an it's what we've done is suggested how to achieve getting to a number that sounds like advisory is comfortable with. We did work closely with Mark, so uh, how you deal with it is you know up to you. And it's the same to me. It's the same question as with respect to uh, to legal fees. If the fifteen thousand is our best guess or estimate as to what the what the, the liability will be, then fine. But if our, if our best guess is that we will, in fact, be spending the 40000 that has been reserved. Well, okay. as I say, historically, it's been a turn back, which means the reserves that have been used in the past haven't been needed as much, uh, except for this past, okay. this fiscal year. OK. OK, we will, um, we will then I will move and vote the numbers read uh, at our meeting on Tuesday. So I think that takes us to Article 4. Um, and I have to say, again, even after six years, I'm still not clear what Article 4 does. but. Um, and given that we don't have an amount to vote on, nor a, uh, any kind of contract to approve, I'm going to vote. Uh, I'm going to uh, take a motion of no action on Article Four, which is to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate or transfer from available funds a sum of money, and if so, what sum to fund cost items <coughs> included in collective bargaining agreements executed by the town, or take any other action related thereto. Moved. Second, or mo a motion. Second. <coughs> Second. Second. Any discussion? I asked him if he had anything to say. It's good. All in favor? Okay. Passes unanimously. <clears throat> Article 5. <clears throat> to see if the town will vote to transfer from available funds a sum of money, and if so, what sum? For the purpose of supplementing various line items of the town's fiscal year 2013 budget, previously voted by the town under Article 3 of the warrant for the 2012 annual town meeting, or make any other adjustments to the fiscal year 2013 budget that may be necessary, or take any action related thereto. And forgive me, I just have to make sure I'm reading from the right list here. And again, we will vote these on Tuesday, but for discussion purposes, I will, uh, I will read them. And again, if there is a hold, um, just uh, say so. Okay, we have 15,000 for the town clerk, 45,000 police overtime, 21,786 for debt service interest related to settlement of an assessor's case, $90,000 for snow and ice removal, $30,000 for legal, $46,000 for employee benefits, $7,500 for veterans, for a total of 255,286. Any discussion? Mark, what was that total? Total was 255, 255, 256. Thank you. Okay. And what was town council? Town council was $30,000 $30, $30, $30, $30. legal. There's no questions. I'll move on to uh, Article 6, which is to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate or transfer from available funds or borrow a sum of money, and if so, what sum, for highway improvements under the authority of Chapter 90 of the general laws as funded by various state budgets, authorize the selectmen to apply for, accept, expend, and borrow in anticipation of state aid for such projects or take any other action related thereto. I will take a motion to approve Article 6. Moved. Second. 
Any discussion? All in favor? Passes unanimously. Article 7, which deals with revolving funds. To see, to see if the town will vote to authorize or reauthorize, as the case may be, the use of revolving funds containing receipts from the fees charged to users of the services provided by the various boards, departments, or offices of the town, pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half of the general laws, or take any other action related thereto. I'll take a motion to uh, um, recommend favorable action on Article 7. Moved. Second. All, any discussion? All in favor? Passes unanimously. Article 8. These are capital acquisitions for the town. And um, we, will, we will vote each of these uh, individually. So um, so I'll, I'll read the article, read the lines, uh, and we let's... Um, and then we will go back and revisit all of these. Article 8. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate or transfer from available funds or borrow pursuant to any applicable statute a sum of money, and if so, what sum, for the purpose of capital expenditures for the offices, departments, boards, and commissions of the town of Sherburne, and to determine if any amount borrowed under this article shall be contingent upon the passage of a ballot question exempting the amounts required to pay for the bonds from the provisions of Proposition 2 and a half or take any action related thereto. We have 11 items to consider. Um, number one, the first three are for the fire department. Uh, number one, command vehicle. Oh. 40, you, you don't need to put a hold on it. We're going to come, right. we're going to ask proponents to, right. to talk about each one. Um, fire department, uh, command vehicle for $40,000. Fire department, computer server, $5,500. Fire department, um, the warrant says HVAC repairs. It should actually read HVAC replacement to station one. Um, it's a to be determined number. <coughs> Board of Selectmen, a um, solar pedestrian activated crossing light on Main Street. Um, I thought we changed this number. To, from 9 to 12. Just over 10, I think. It's over 13 is the real number, but the warrant had already been voted and printed. Okay. You know, so 9,032, we'll talk about that. Then we have two for CM&D, a uh, dump truck for $60,000 and a pickup truck for $30,000. The um, uh, uh, transfer station, um, an asphalt overlay, including fencing and containers for $80,000. Communications Committee is recommending communications equipment for $110,000. Board of Selectmen um, is requesting $80,000 for a Pine Hill Emergency Access Road. The Pine Hill School Building Committee has a, um, a variety of capital needs for Pine Hill School, $1,325,000. And Traffic Safety is proposing engineering and reconstruction of, of um, Woodland Mill and Woodland West Goulding intersection uh, for $110,000. So we'll, uh, we'll take these in order. And if there's a... <coughs> try to are, we, are we limited to, the mic? to five minutes? I'm sorry? Are we going five minutes on these? Or? Yeah, five minutes for, for, each, for each one. George, thank you. I'm loving the Tic Tacs. <laughs> no, no, thanks, but good substitute. Well done. I'm sorry I was late. Okay. Okay, good morning. I'm going to speak about the three <coughs> articles. One is for a command vehicle. <coughs> Excuse me. Next is for a server for fire departments. And last is for 
Let's see what the citizenry text is in. Mark, before, before he goes up, I understand this table is available and we hand over our mic. Uh -huh. If anybody wants to do that on, in this uh, exercise. So, would you rather do that, Neil? Okay. First article relative to a command vehicle. All right, Neil, and we're going we're gonna to take these one at a time. Yeah. So. So we'll start with the command vehicle. Very simply, the request here is that the current vehicle, which is the 2002 Ford Explorer, uh, be replaced. That this is a vehicle used by the fire department as a command vehicle. It does emergency responses. It's used by the officer in charge. It's used for inspectional activity as well and other fire department business. It carries critical uh, equipment, medical supplies. It is, serves as the department's command post, uh, has radios, SCBA, and other command resources. All right, it's also used as a primary response vehicle when our ambulance is out of service. So why are we looking to replace this? Number one, this vehicle has become less reliable. I've had it for numerous weekends so far this year, and two of those weekends I've had to place it out of service due to issues. The vehicle is now 12 years old. Increasing cost of maintenance. Eric, you called me the other day and requested some specific data. So, so far this year we've spent $912.13 in repairs for this vehicle in the first three months. When it comes to 2012, we spent $1,255, and in 2011-2010, we spent less than $400. So you will see that there is an increasing trend in terms of repair and maintenance expenditures, which come out of the fire department lineup. I'm sorry, what was it last year? I'm sorry. Last year was $1,255. <clears throat> All right, and this year, again, the first three months is $912.13. <clears throat> So that is the command vehicle. I do want to put out today that in the selections meeting, I was asked the question, is can this vehicle go one more year? And the answer is, this vehicle can go one more year with the understanding that we're reaching the <coughs> end of this vehicle's effective life, all right, that repairs are going to continue to increase in terms of cost here. I'd also point out, I think the town is going to have a challenge in the sense that we do hire a fire chief that you're likely going to need to deal with a, a, an additional vehicle for that individual. So it certainly is my recommendation that we move forward with it this year. If you choose, you cannot. You need to understand that next year you're going to have to replace this vehicle. Plus, we're going to have the other issue, which becomes you still need to have, if the chief has a vehicle, there is officers in charge each weekend. So it's different officers in the fire department who are not the chief who cover weekend shifts. And during the day, the chief may be off. So I just want to point that out. I do want to be honest and upfront and say, can it go one more year? Sure it can, but you're getting near the end of its effective, useful life. Any questions for, uh, for Neil on this? So it's, um, it's costing more in maintenance, but has it also become unreliable? And <coughs> if so, what's the, the consequence of it not being available? Well, as I said to you, twice this year, I personally had it while I was on uh, duty during a weekend, and I've had to pull it out of service. And the first time, the struts broke on the vehicle. So again, I went back to my personal car, and I didn't have all the equipment. I took what I could <coughs> out of it. Uh, the second time was during a snowstorm, and we had an issue with the brakes. So what it means is that vehicle gets taken out of service, and we go back to personal vehicles. And the important part becomes, I can't carry in my personal vehicle all of the radios and other command equipment that's enclosed in cabinets in that vehicle. It's just not feasible to do so. So it comes out of service. So is there a hazard to the town, especially for people who are officers who may not have four-wheel drive vehicles? Yes, it is. I'm lucky to have another Ford Explorer personal car that I can use that will get me up uh, you know, driveways during a snowstorm and, and, and through areas that have not been treated by uh, CMD. So we, Go ahead. You know, we have capital budget as a policy. We ask, and Neil has provided, um, same thing with CMD when there are these large expenditures. We look at maintenance records and look to see that those maintenance records start to approach the annual amortized cost of the vehicle, and that's essentially what's happening here. You figure 900 bucks in three months, it's, it's $3,500, $3,600 a year. This thing's had 12 years on it, so the numbers are about crossing over. It's costing you about as much to repair a year as its amortization. So that's consistent with our policy where we say, yeah, it starts to, starts to look like it's, it makes sense, just purely on an expense financial basis. So is capital budget here? Do you have a, uh, a recommendation on this one? We haven't voted yet, uh, but, but what Eric right. just said. Mike. To to Mike. And if I could also, Bob, yeah. ask you to introduce This yourself. is uh, Bob Searle with Capital Budget. 
Uh, we haven't voted yet on this, but what Eric just described uh, is essentially the conversation that we had. We, when we had the last conversation, we didn't have the maintenance records, so we literally just heard them as you guys did. Okay. I have a question. Um, Neil, could you explain a little bit further about the car for the new chief if one is hired? I'm, I'm not sure I could quite understand that. Okay. So very simply, typically a full-time fire chief will be provided with a vehicle like the police chief is for emergency responses. So this vehicle that we're using today is used primarily on the weekends by officers, all right? It's used during the week by firefighters uh, and inspectors to go out throughout town to do inspections and for other fire department business. And as I said, it serves as a backup response vehicle if our ambulance went down. And unfortunately, last year our ambulance was down a number of times. So very simply, the problem becomes if you have a full-time chief and they may live in a surrounding community, typically they are given a vehicle. Now again, this is a negotiated thing, but I just want to point out here that in many cases that chief is given a vehicle and you'd still need a vehicle likely for the fire department um, members and officers in charge. And the, and the chief's vehicle that he might be <coughs> appropriated, he uses that for transportation and for what else? Uh, for emergency responses. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna hear all of these, and, and including um, I think articles nine and ten before we go back and vote, so we get a complete picture of, uh, uh, of the capital needs of the town. So, uh, unless there's other questions on the command vehicle, why don't we move on to the, the server, please? I would think this to be pretty basic, but very simply, we have an old server that dates back to 2006. Since that point in time, technology has changed rapidly. The programs that we are using require significantly greater, shall we say, computing power. And at this point in time, we're looking to replace our computer server. I'll give you all sorts of other details if you'd like, but I think this is a pretty basic request. Looks like you're on a roll. Okay. Uh, last one is the warrant article for fire station repairs. I'd like to start by saying um, thank you to the Green Energy or Green Building Committee because they have been uh, instrumental in helping us get information. But I'm not a building person myself, so I am going to ask Sean Colleen to come up here and to run through this presentation with you. I also apologize that some of the information has come to us late after uh, working with uh, the Green, build uh, Green Energy. Building Energy Committee. Thank you. All right, so I do want to apologize about uh, some of the information getting here late and having to put in the TVA. So we'll go through that. Again, Sean and I are not necessarily, at least I'm not a building person per se, and the town really doesn't have a building person. So we've had these issues, and this has fallen back upon us to try and bring this forward to you to address some significant issues at the fire station. So Sean's going to walk <coughs> you through the presentation for the fire station repairs. All right. He's right behind me. Slide over? Yeah, I'll slide over. I'm going to pass around this pipe, um, which is a typical pipe that's come out of that station. And just so you look, look at the threads. If you look, can I see one second? On the bottom, if you look at the threads right here, you can see what we're trying to point out, which is that the pipes are virtually being that's eaten up in this building. So look at the top part of that. So I'll just remind you, you've only got five minutes, so. That's fine, we'll get through it. You, you may want to start here and work your way backwards. Or All right. Well, to understand, the building, although it was built in 2001, has a steam boiler system. Uh, where did you want me to start? Cost? Uh, you can start wherever you like. You only have five minutes. My, I suggest you start here, though. All right. The scope is to replace the existing steam boiler system, all the piping that's with it, um, and to repair any damage that will be associated with that work already existing. In that, we're also going to insulate the attic of the building. <coughs> which is deteriorated and not functioning at all. Uh, why piping throughout the building is degraded due to the water quality and it's failing, as you'll see by that pipe. Uh, the repair costs, you can see we have in there 2010, two, 2011 was 3,000, 14,866 last year. Uh, and we're already at three to 4,000 this year. We're continuing to have failures. Uh, and there's obviously collateral damage that can happen. It hasn't been significant, which leads us to believe the pipes that haven't failed yet will and cause significant damage. Many of them are concealed. Uh, also, the insulation. We've had damage 
uh, three times in the past seven years. I'm going to pass these pictures around. They somewhat illustrate what's happening. That's a picture from last night. It's still valid. There's snow on half of the roof uh, caused by lack of insulation. Good ventilation, but lack of insulation. Uh, that also caused huge icicles on the front, which we've had to take the ladder truck to knock off before they take someone's head off or crush a car. Uh, that also goes into the factoring of how big a boiler needs to be. Um, they size the boiler to assume there's insulation in the attic. There isn't. Uh, so if we were to go back and not insulate, we'd have to resize the boiler. Uh, we'll skip to costs. The cost of doing both projects in, in just the raw construction and installation is 125.5. Uh, on top of that is 18.6. In general contracting and project manager, there's several different contractors that will have to be in there, so it's not something the town can just handle on its own. There's some project design, engineering. We can't just, we're doing a change of the heating system. We can't just send out an RFP. There's no one here qualified enough to write that. Uh, we need someone to design that. Obvious contingency. Uh, so that leaves us with 1717. The Green <coughs> Communities Grant is already has slated $18,000 towards this project. We need to use that or we'll lose it. Uh, that money will go either somewhere else or just go away. I'm not quite sure where it'll go. Uh, this is just got jumbled around. Uh, the first line is annual savings. We're spending about um, 6000 in natural gas and close to $10,000 in electricity there. So between the combination of the two projects, you know, that number is slightly debatable. We're tagging it at 3000 a year. Uh, the projected maintenance savings, 5800 is an average of a couple of the past few years. That obviously could go anywhere. Uh, the insurance deductible, if we just average out, we put in 1000 uh, which is simply if we keep having claims against it, uh, it averages out at a thousand. It's higher than that. And, we, and we've been spending but that thousand. What? We've been spending that thousand. We have twice. We've twice we've had claims. Yeah. Once we've had a loss that was just fixed under that. Uh, so we're calling the total savings at ninety eight hundred dollars a year, <clears throat> which we'll pay back in fifteen. So, I mean, high level. Obviously, when you look at that number, it was a number that. Uh, looks to be a big number, but the reality becomes we have a choice to make today, which is to continue to put more money into a system that we've been told by the town's contractor is going to fail. And if you look at the pipe, you can see why. We keep having leaks in the pipes. Many of them have been in the attic area, so they've dropped water down in the building, and we've been able to catch them. But it also is occurring and can occur in the wall. So we can continue to go ahead and invest more money into the existing system with a, a furnace that was used from the old fire station to the new fire station and or we can go ahead and we can approach and try and uh, put a new system in to solve the issue and create uh, or install a more efficient system. So you know, the last points here were, what if we don't do this? We know it's going to fail, so we're going to continue to spend more dollars in terms of maintenance and we have more pipes burst, all right? Obviously, if we have a major failure and we don't pass this today, we may be coming back to you next year. And we may have to, we may have to go ahead and uh, uh, install a system in an emergency situation. It will cause more damage to the building. Our personnel who stay there during the day will be displaced. Obviously, we have crews on duty uh, during many days and nights. All right, our fire our apparatus will need to be relocated because if we don't have heat, we obviously have water and other uh, temper, temperature sensitive items in the ambulance, and I think we'll create a significant financial challenge for the town. The other thing is we have the ice dams that will continue, and insurance costs will increase due to lost activity. So, that's the high level, <coughs> probably eight minutes. One question. Uh, have you had a chance to um, get a uh, judgment from the town treasurer how much of this uh, expense would be bondable? How much we can borrow? We have not. Okay. We have not. Neil, and, and if I understand it right, the Green Communities Grant is locked in. That, that money is here for sure, no matter what, so we can rely on the 18000 I, I defer to Michael Lesser on that. Hi, Michael Lesser, Energy Committee. Uh, there's a timing issue, possibly, in terms of when we have to use the money within a certain time period. I'm not sure how many extensions. We haven't tried to see how many more extensions we could get for that money. 
Um, how, does do the time period, how does the time period line up with the expected timing if this were to pass? If this were to pass, we could probably, it's 90% it's sure we could do it. We have to, or 100% probably. Um, but I, I we haven't gone through it. It's like 90. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's a presidential it's election. I, I have a poker game that you can be invited to. <laughs> But the money is here today, so to speak. The money is here. To we today, have the money, yes. We have the, the money now. Okay? Right. So I'll say that much. <laughs> I shouldn't go there. And, Neil, how, I mean, I know these numbers came quickly, but the last iteration on the numbers we saw, I know you weren't happy with them. I think there was some oversight in there that you thought should be removed, right? There was some, I think you thought, duplicative cost. How confident are you in this set of numbers that you've given us today? We, we've approached this in two ways. We've had Amoresco who has come and put together a quote for us, right, a very comprehensive quote, and they came out roughly with 150. And I think John Hyde, who's a contractor, has worked with individual quotes for the insulation and the HVAC or the, the uh, heating system repair uh, with uh, the Green or the Energy Committee to come up with this other number of 150. So at this point, we have two different ways we've approached getting at the number, and we think it's 150. Of course, our goal is to make it come in at less than that, but right now, we don't want to be, find ourselves in a situation where we ask for 125 and find ourselves $10,000 short. We'd rather ask for a little bit more to make sure it's covered and do it right. When, when was this system installed? When the building was built. Which was? 2001. <laughs> years. I mean, we would, should have expected it to last longer. Right. I presume, right? <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to use my bull, bully pull while well, I've got David here, which is to say this is sort of a recurring theme for us where we build things and then have to go back and fix them. And we're going to talk about another one of these projects over at yeah. the middle school um, so that we welcome <laughs> you joining us as a procurement officer. And I think this is an area where you know, definitely needs. Yeah, some, I, some I should add, we have to rebuild them after the statute of repose has passed, too, uh, the six years, so that's not uh, a good thing. We have, we have no recourse. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, not on this. Did you say we're going to get a schedule of debt projection, some sort of a picture of the overall debt, the impact of these uh, on our debt structure? Is yeah. capital budget going to yeah. provide? Bob, you want to? Yes, the answer to that short answer. We're working on getting the numbers together. So, for example, these numbers we're hearing for the first time as you're hearing them, um, but we're in the process of pulling together a five-year projection and getting all the line items, making sure we have that as close to right as possible. But there's been a lot of back and forth. So we have, we have an estimate right now, but it's going to change. So we're working very hard to get that as quickly as we can. Thank you. Okay, uh, Bob, can we get that estimate by Tuesday? Are there any questions for uh, Neil or Sean? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Takes us to the um, the solar pedestrian activated crossing light. There you go. I saw this here. Thank you. You can study it here. Yeah, yeah. I know it changes every time. So, as you're aware, uh, the uh, Disability Advisory Committee, Traffic Safety, and the Police Department uh, collaborated to um, apply for a grant. Rick, you might want to introduce yourself to you, please. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rick Thompson. I'm the chief of police, and I'm a uh, non-voting member of the uh, Traffic Safety Committee. As, as I was saying, uh, through a collaborative effort between the Disability Advisory Committee, Traffic Safety, and the Police Department, uh, we applied for and received a grant from the Sheridan uh, Business Association um, to apply $3,000 to a solar-powered crosswalk sign that we would like to implement uh, at North Main Street in Cemetery Lane, which is by the uh, uh, fire headquarters. And I've provided you with um, 
some information on the particular signage that uh, Brad Van Brent worked very hard to locate. And they've also provided you with some uh, cost estimates on uh, the entire project. I think we're all pretty up to date on this one. Is there anybody who would like to comment? Question? Well, actually, I do have a question. Um, at the last meeting, Brad mentioned something about um, expecting that there might be some sort of concern from the town about the style of this pole, which is just, you know, sort of a, I don't know what you call that, but some, you know, some undecorative metal. Yes. Um, have you guys investigated, uh, you know, what, what uh, a, a nicer looking pole would look like? Would there, there was discussion at the Traffic Safety Committee about that, and, and there are a few different <laughs> poles that uh, are utilized in, in Wellesley, for example. Right. Um, and Brad actually built into this uh, cost estimate some decorative, decorative posts and bases. So oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Elliot. Yes, Elliot. <clears throat> I requested that a crosswalk could, could you introduce yourself, in front please? of my house. Yeah. Elliot. And I was turned down Elliot Taylor, 30 North Main Street, across from Powder House Lane. I requested the selectmen put a crosswalk in front of my house so I can walk across to the uh, post office and the bank. And uh, I was turned down. And uh, now you want to put flashing lights up at uh, Cemetery Lane, and uh, I don't think it's really necessary. And uh, I'm opposed. Any other comment? If not, we'll move on to CM&D. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Year we're looking to replace. Could, could you introduce yourself, please, Ed? Ed Wagner, director of Thank you. Um, this year we're looking to replace two vehicles. Uh, number one is a 2004 dump truck, our truck number 27. This vehicle currently has 47,000 miles. We do not have an hour meter, but the hours are significantly higher, um, indicating a, a lot more usage. This vehicle is one of our main line. Um, Dump trucks for spring, summer, fall for cleanups and normal day-to-day -day operations. Uh, we also utilize it in the wintertime as a backup snowplow vehicle. Uh, the amount we're looking for is $60,000. This vehicle is experiencing a number of different electrical issues and has become very unreliable. And I just do not want to go through this thing and replace an entire harness computer system fuse box <coughs> to alleviate all the problems. I just don't think the uh, it's worth it. In addition to the electrical issues, it uh, has a number of areas in the, uh, the body and frame where it's beginning to show uh, some signs of rot, wear and tear. And again, I just don't think it's a, a good investment to sink more money into this vehicle. Number two, we're looking to replace a 2002 Chevy pickup truck. This vehicle currently has over 220,000 miles. We're looking for $30,000. This vehicle is the one that I drive day to day. It's a, uh, just a regular pickup truck with the radios, lights. Um, the vehicle has lived its life. It's, um, it's a uh, crapshoot every morning when I uh, come to work or during the day of what lights are going to show up on the <coughs> dashboard. I have brake lights, I have flashing uh, alternator lights. Um, it's sometimes that it, the entire electrical system will just go down, show that I don't have gas, I'm not moving, and then all of a sudden you hit a bump and it pops back up. Um, I believe we paid 25000 for this way back when, and the town has gotten every dollar out of this vehicle. I have a question. 
Yeah. Is there any um, reason why we can't lease versus purchase? Is there anything the, 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 instead of having all of that money out laid all at once? We can certainly investigate that with uh, Mr. Williams. Um, they do have a number of different uh, uh, leasing uh, available for municipalities. I believe the leasing, though, has only worked in the town's favor for the higher capital items, such as a. Uh, um, Say that again. Sorry. <clears throat> in the past, um, I believe the leasing options are better suited for when you're up into the hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar range. Um, the, for the payback for the town, but Mr. Williams can probably investigate that further. We would actually have to investigate that with the um, treasurer. The, um, the treasurer is responsible for doing borrowing, or he would have to sign off on the leasing. And if you do a lease, it's going to be a higher interest rate payable over three years as opposed to borrowing with a lower interest rate over five years. I, I just had a comment. Um, I just wanted to point out that when Ed Wagner came in as CMD director, he he did a, a analysis of all of his vehicles and equipment. Correct, Ed? Yes. And, and and he looked in a way, you know, in a responsible manner to to project out what would fail when and and what he needed when. So I, I would just point out that um, you know when Ed comes in with a recommendation we should put a lot of stock into it because he's put a lot of thought into when, um, you know, his overall uh, department and when the vehicles are going to um, require too much service or when they're going to go out of commission and that type of thing. Is that right, Ed? That's, that's absolutely correct. We did a 10-year plan <clears throat> in the past couple of years. We've uh, gotten away from funding our capital, so I've kind of gotten out of the mode <clears throat> of what I want to replace to what I actually have to replace. Um, also, too, when going through in vehicles uh, last year, Instead of um, going with the track list, we supplemented that with a different vehicle that was half the cost, more attachments, more versatile. Um, down the road, when I go to replace some of the larger snow fighters, I'm going to be looking at com combining those, a catch basin vehicle and a snow fighter, and kind of uh, make as many universal soldiers, if you will, uh, for the fleet. And how, how old is the dump truck? It's a 2004. Mark? The useful life of the one tons is typically um, you, you want to replace them in about eight years. We've kind of gotten into the 10 year plus, um, but you do get the most return when you go to trade them in at the uh, eight year mark. Mark? Um, yes. I asked Ed, and hopefully he has it for a town meeting when you know the voters decide what to do, just to show some pretty pictures or ugly pictures is really what it is and some more information about the vehicles. So I, I know the one that, the, for instance, the pickup trucks, you've got 200 and something thousand miles on it and it's a rust bucket. But the, the real point is that, you know, it's a business. We have facilities, we have equipment, the stuff wears out. We don't depreciate it in the models that we do. There's no depreciation in there. Where we get that is when we fun things through bond debt and so forth. And each year in the numbers that you're seeing, um, for instance, we, w there was no hold on the uh, million and a half dollars of uh, debt retirement. Of that million and a half dollars of debt retirement, a million dollars of that is principal reduction. And so I've gotten to the simple point of, you know, that's a reasonable number of replacement, not, you know, of equipment type of thing if you, and just keeping steady debt. And that's not without, discussing with capital budget or anything, but that's just my simple man's approach. So anyway, I hope Ed has um, more complete information by the time we roll around to town meeting that, that, that proves his case here. Um, uh, and then this truck, I've, I've actually seen that truck up close and personal. Uh, it turns out you have two of those, and this one happens to be not working very well. It's a nice way to put it. Yeah, and the other issue with the, uh, the pictures, uh, Peter, is like in my truck, uh, for instance, um, it's, it looks great from the outside, but once you throw it up on the list, that's where you really see the rust. Yeah. And again, it looks great from the outside, but the electrical issues. Um, I do not believe this is going to pass the inspection this coming June uh, with the number of issues that I have. And it's not for lack of maintenance effort and so forth. You know, it, the stuff gets used hard. That's reality. Well, we do still have a full-time mechanic on staff. That's right? correct. Yes. So you, you did a great job of finding us a, um, a used uh, 
call them snow fighters, right? Any chance to do that here on the dump truck? Uh, not on the dump truck, but on the pickup truck, I'll definitely be heading over to Odessa to see what I can find. That actual price is actually reflected as a good used price. So this 30000 assumes a used? Yes. What size pickup truck are we looking for? Uh, half ton. So that would be a Ford F? F-150. 150? I can get a new one for 30 <coughs> These days? Yeah. New F-150 these days, you're looking at 45. I don't know. A guy in my office just bought one, but we'll talk. Okay, any other questions? Um, takes us to the transfer station. Thank you, Ed. to take you through a history of uh, what's been done at the transfer station over the years since it was first built in 1986, but uh, I don't have time. So just take my word for it. Um, these color-coded numbers here for costs, the black is what uh, the town of Sherburn actually spent out of taxpayer money. The rest is grants uh, or not spent. The green is grants and the... Um, blue was not spent. That's a blast from the past. Um, so we spent 560, we spent $3,000, we spent 19,726, uh, and we spent 12546 since 1986 when the transfer station was such uh, built. So in 27 years, a total of $46,011.58 came from property taxpayers. Uh, no money was ever planned or allocated for road surface maintenance beyond CM&D patching. But I contrast that to uh, the revenues that we brought in in FY12 alone, $22,342.71. So, oh, uh, this says why repave, <laughs> in case it's not obvious at this time. The current surface definitely is at its end of useful life. We have patches on top of patches. We have problems for vendors and residents. We're worried about safety and liability for the town. We have site constraints. We cannot change the road layout. We cannot excavate in order to reconstruct. Um, we had an engineer come in last year after town meeting, and we find that our constraints are even worse than what we thought before. Uh, these are pictures of our current conditions, potholes, potholes, potholes. You can't really see in this picture, but there's patches on top of patches there. Uh, this is crumbling asphalt here. This is the disposal area where people get out of their cars to get rid of their trash. This is also the, Good. just at the, place where the uh, driveway rises to the disposal area and it's very uneven surface here people <coughs> often trip there um, 
This is a picture of the constraints that we have with the wetlands on both sides. The uh, capped hill on this side, there's really no room to expand, so the driveway is basically going to be laid out exactly the same. We can't change it at all. <coughs> um, so what do we have as alternatives? Uh, we could just patch the potholes again, or we could overlay only one section, but um, there's no agreement on which section is most in need. <laughs> uh, so, oh dear, this is too big. But anyway, we have two um, bids, uh, one for 54,382, one for 51,837, pretty close, but they both proposed the same thing, a one inch leveling course followed by a two inch overlay, and it's not eligible for chapter 90 funds. Uh, it's not a road, it's a driveway. Um, so here we have the fences. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful. This is out on 27, coming in from Natick. Beautiful. That's West Virginia, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, when we got the estimates, we thought maybe we could do away with the outside portion and just do the inside portion. That would be pretty cheap, but um, I've looked through the statutes and it sounds like we, sh oops, sorry. Uh, we should have a uh, fence. Um, it wasn't quite clear that it was really required, but my DEP contacts tell me that um, if it was actually laid out along Route 27, it was probably required in the original site assignment. So we probably need to replace it. <coughs> Here are the containers. This is our oldest container dating back to before we had a transfer station. This is from landfill days. It probably contributes to the feeling of one of my former members back in 2000 said, this place looks like a little piece of Appalachia right here in Sherburn. This is uh, one of our containers. This floor is resting right here. This door has been uh, Pried up with uh, boards. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm not paying attention to time. I'm trying to do this as quickly as I can. These two containers are uh, former trash compactor containers that have been repurposed for storage. This one had a hole in the side, had two holes in the side. We've patched it up with metal pieces, which are not in such great shape themselves. This one isn't in such great shape either. Is that my? <coughs> okay. So the storage containers, we can buy a used as is for 1500 with a delivery charge or a refurbished for 3300 with a delivery charge or brand spanking new one for 3700 That would be my choice because then we don't have to deal with whatever used issues that, so I'm done. <laughs> Mark, can I add something to this? Um, Sure. I want to put on my uh, lawyer's hat here for a minute. Landfills are highly regulated. There's a variety of statutes, federal laws, state laws, and the like. Paving at the site appears to be part of the capping and closing that was done some years ago. And therefore, the paving being part of the cap has a regulatory and legal element such that it's my belief, again as a lawyer, if we don't maintain this road and keep it impervious to liquid, we run the potential or the danger of violating a variety of federal and state laws. If a violation were to occur, we would in incur tremendous liability and penalties. 
So I would suggest to you that a prudent course here is to act in a in a, a prudent manner in advance of any regulatory or legal issues. Number two, we as a community have a, a responsibility to encourage the use of the transfer station to prevent illegal dumping, to make it comfortable for our residents, and to provide a facility that we all can be proud of. So for all these reasons, the the, uh, I believe the board has supported this in the past and supports it now. Yeah, I was going to say to make it, make it very simple and short, all of us have had this conversation for the last couple of years. We, we understand what the issues are. I mean, uh, and I think that now is the time for us to do what we are able to do, which we've discussed numerous times. I think it's fairly simple. So, yeah, we're for it. There it is. Any questions? Yeah, I had one. So, Carol, I, I mean, the numbers drifted up a little bit, I think, since what we saw. So, adding these numbers up, you get six, the, the, the paving and the, the fence gives you 62, but you asked for 80, so that's 18 <coughs> left over. I thought you were only asking for three containers? Well, it would be nice to get all five. We need five containers in all. It would be nice to get all five at once. It would make the place look so much better to have five matching containers. <coughs> I think that's what we last agreed is mm. to go for the full five, so particularly going used or otherwise. That's where the 80 came from. So and, and, and in our discussion, there was a you had some notion that you'll do the paving if there's an overrun, or then you just take less containers. Is that still your thinking? Right. Uh -huh. And of the containers, do you have a recommendation for used or half yes, used? Yes, my, my preference is to buy the new ones because they will have a longer life. I just had a question about the. Um, Excuse me. Can I just oh, follow sorry. up on that? Yeah. I mean, have you? Can you can you tell us how much longer they're going to be? And I mean, it's pretty simple. <laughs> pretty simple calculation, right? Uh. No, I have not figured out how much longer they are. But used ones obviously don't last as long. I mean, just like a used car. Right. But we have containers that are. 25 years old up there. Right. That's the problem. And they right. don't look that good. Right. And of course, they they don't getting all at once. Yeah. And not only that, they, they let in the weather and they're, you know, they have rusting floors and people could fall through and. Well, just like a used car, you got to pay attention to what you buy, right? <laughs> I was just wondering George, about on, on the containers, can you get, uh, like, scrap metal money for the ones you have? Yes. Would it offset? Yes. Uh, one of my slides actually uh, went into that. Uh, the, the empty containers weigh around two tons. I was really surprised how much they weigh. And um, we have gotten on the scrap metal mar market between $30 a ton at the <coughs> beginning of the recession to $250 a ton at the height of the market. So really depends on when we get rid of them. Right now we're getting 200 a ton. Okay, so how many tons? I mean, well, five, ton, ton of five, thousand bucks? five so tons of times two tons is a thousand tons times 200. More math than I want to do. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> 400, 400, 400, 400 piece. Times two, right, 400 piece times five is 2,000 bucks. Yeah. I mean, how can we build that into this or? or that just comes back later. I no, it goes into the general fund. And but conceptually, yes. <laughs> conceptually. Yeah. I mean, it does somewhat speak more in favor of your proposal because it's all going to the same place. Right, exactly. It, it, it is a factor. There's some offset somewhere. A positive to what you're proposing right. anyway. Yeah. And getting it all done at once probably would not be a bad thought either, just given the aesthetic considerations as well. I know that seems petty, but. Then Bless I don't you. have to come back to you next year and talk about it. <laughs> There's something to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, that idea is gone. <laughs> Sean, did you want to speak to this? Sean, Sean to that. That. She went kind of quick on that slide, but I think it was only 10% between the new and the used. Uh, you can't use the used as is. You're going to have to do work to it. That's not really an option. 
So it was, I think it was 300 dollars. Good point. Oh yeah, well said. Oh, I missed that. <laughs> we could use that view on the modeling as well. <laughs> Facilities manager. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Carol. Okay, thank you. Uh, communications equipment, one hundred and ten thousand dollars. No chair for the chief on this. Sorry, Jim. Yeah, go ahead. No, no problem. I'm Jim Campbell. I'm a member of the communications committee in, in town. Uh, the committee basically is composed of myself, a couple other laymen, and then the police and the fire chief. Uh, the main focus of our committee's effort is to provide for adequate and reliable public safety communications for police and fire throughout the town. And we have a uh, very efficient uh, state-of-the-art system but it has a weak link, and that is that the signal that's transmitted from the portables back to the uh, Brush Hill repeater at the top of Hunting Lane and, and several significant areas of town is just not adequate. Uh, it's adequate from the mobile radios and the, and the cruisers and the fire engines, but not uh, with the handheld portables. And the areas are significant. Uh, one is Farm Pond, uh, Farm Pond Beach. Another is the Rocky Narrows. And the third is the uh, Bogusto uh, community down there, uh, Bogusto, the neighborhood down there. We, uh, the problem basically is that the portables are the much weaker signal and uh, uh, UHF communications is line of sight and it's interrupted in trying to get to Brush Hill by Pine Hill, by Nason Hill, by and, and other elements of the terrain in town so that the signal uh, just doesn't get through reliably. We uh, addressed this problem by hiring a uh, consultant, a system engineering firm, to look at the situation and do coverage <coughs> maps of the town. And they confirmed our weak signal areas and also looked at what we see as the logical solution here, which is to add two antennas and receivers, one for police and fire, at the tower under development now on South Lake, at the near the intersection of Goulding and South Lake Street. That's going to be a cell tower that provides us both a, a pedestal to mount our antennas at the top, as well as a communications shelter for our, our radio equipment. So that's a key part of this, and it's a very fortuitous that that's finally become available. We've long known this would be a great solution and the lease we have does require the uh, installer of the, of the cell tower to, to mount this equipment for us, but it does not pay for our equipment. In addition to that equipment, we need uh, a microwave link to get the signal back to Brush Hill at the repeater site, and then what's called a voting comparator that looks at the stronger of the two signals and transmits that out over the repeater. The, uh, the entire uh, cost of this equipment is just under $100,000, 98850 We have firm quotes for all that. Uh, 6000 of that number is needed uh, immediately in order to be able to uh, have the antennas available to mount on the new cell tower. The, the contract require, lease requires the installer to mount these as part of the lease, uh, so we wouldn't incur the expense of that. <clears throat> and uh, so that, that's really what we're asking for that. The 10,000 is in there because of contingency, such as we need to get permission from the uh, cell, cell tower operator at Brush Hill to mount the other end of the microwave link up there, which we uh, have not obtained as yet. So that, that's the basic uh, proposal. You've seen the diagrams and the coverage maps and everything. We presented it to you as well as capital budget, and we're here today to answer questions. And what I would like to do at this point is turn it over to the chief who is going to answer a question that was uh, posed to us <coughs> yesterday as to why can't we just supplement the radio coverage in town that we have in these weak signal areas with cell, cell, cellular communication, cellular radios, which would work through the new cell tower. So the very simple answer would be uh, officer safety. And, and actually, I wanted to uh, invite Officer Stickney up here. Uh, and, uh, 
I'm going to pick on a uh, resident too to come up. <coughs> you want to come up and be a dummy for us for a little while? <laughs> so you can see that our system here is equipped with a portable radio which he keeps <coughs> above his left chest here. And there's a reason for that, it's a safety issue. Okay? So if we were at a, at a home and Leo Kavanaugh was getting a little froggy with us about something, uh, the officer has to keep his keep his hands ready just to be able to not deal with Leo attacking him, basically. Fight, fight, fight. Tez a bad guy. He looks tough in the skeleton. He does. He does. That's <laughs> me. <laughs> My first bar fight. <laughs> so the officer were required to reach into his pocket to pick up a phone. And now start, you can't. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an officer safety issue. It's, it's a ridiculous idea. I hate to say that, but it is. Um, we can't rely on the phone to communicate with officers. I think I think he'd give you a run for Bravo, it. Well done. Thank you. We we encourage skits. And yeah. part of the <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna pick a new mark, but I don't know. <laughs> should have tased him. Chief, is there an emergency button on his radio? And there is an emergency button on his radio. Yes. Yeah. Any uh, any questions? Can I make a comment? As you know, we have a, uh, all the approvals to construct a new cell tower. This is to provide for additional service to the community, is to provide new revenue for the community. But at the end of the day, it's a public safety issue. In order to get all the permits for this, we had to get a special act of the legislature. And in getting that act, we had to represent to the general court the urgency of the public safety needs. We had uh, some testimony from the police chief that we were able to use, but because of the public safety urgency, the general court waived a number of rules. They required no mitigation for the site. We obtained a two-thirds roll call vote so to some extent, we as a community have made a commitment that there is a public safety need and we're going to meet that public safety need. This, this appropriation is the necessary follow-up to meet that public safety need. So we very much urge that this be enthusiastically adopted and approved and appropriated. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Chief, I was uh, I was hoping to get through the end of uh, these capital items before taking a break, but I think the next one's going to uh, next couple are going to engender some discussion. So, Perfect. if you don't mind, Peter, um, mind. we're going to take a break and we're going to come back to in at uh, 10:35.